episode of Stoke Meter. Uh, we are joined by Danny Fontanesi. And my goodness, Danny, I just found out, grew up in Hawaii. I am completely pumped about that because we lived a long time in Hawaii. And uh, another local girl. Welcome to the show, Danny. Thank you so much. So nice to be here. Uh-oh. And so nice to be talking with a fellow local. I know. <laughs> well, I, I should say fake local. I'm a katonk. So I'm <laughs> transplanted from the mainland of Hawaii, but hey, I'll take I mean, it. Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the, the way that we connected with Danny is I, I read a story about her on LinkedIn and about how she she uh, organized and created her her company. Now, she is a founder and managing partner of a company called Legal Up. Uh, and it was a very interesting story because I, I actually thought you were from New Zealand <laughs> originally. <laughs> and what happened, you were working in New Zealand as a lawyer. I was, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And your husband was a structural engineer out there, as we've well, there, mm-hmm. as we found out. And really, really neat place. New Zealand, I've never been there, but I know a number of people that have just just raved about it, man. It's an it, amazing yeah. place. Uh, but uh, you and you were married. Were you married in New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is where the story gets. Uh, this is where the story really hooked me. Uh, they, they actually, she and her husband came back to the mainland United States to, to start their honeymoon. And of all places, they started in where I currently live now in Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene, and they were getting ready to go across country, right? Mm-hmm, yep. Yeah, and then her husband fell sick, and they thought that it was a simple flu, possibly pneumonia, just because the symptoms became a little bit more intense. Uh, but when the doctor came back, uh, it was actually, actually acute myeloid leukemia. Am I right on that one? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, and so, okay, so I'm not going to go very far because I don't want to get inaccurate in any way, shape, or form, but I've got to pass it over to you and just explain what that was like to find that out, starting the new life. And, and here it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shocking, obviously, um, <laughs> is an understatement. Um, so we were, you know, as you said, we were living in New Zealand at the time and it was, you know, New Zealand's Southern hemisphere. So August is the middle of winter there. Right. So there were a lot of bugs going around. It was one of those seasons where it was just like gnarly colds, gnarly flus going around. And Matt had kind of been, you know, fighting off of what we thought was a cold or something for a few weeks. Um, and then, you know, and then we're traveling for 30 hours coming to the U S um, you know, we had a bunch of layover, you know, you stop in LA and then, you know, getting up to Coeur d'Alene was, you know, two other flights and, and this and that. And so, um, by the time we got to Coeur d'Alene, he was completely wrecked, but we just thought, all right, he needs a day to sleep it off. Um, long story short, he wasn't getting better. He was, you know, having fevers. And, you know, as you said, you know, we thought, okay, he, maybe this is the flu. Maybe it's something, you know, that he needs antibiotics for. We, you know, we're actually staying at my um, aunt's property at the time. My uncle had some antibiotics on him. He's like, here, take a, an amoxicillin. Maybe it'll, you know, help. Um, turns out amoxicillin doesn't cure cancer. Um, so we, you know, next day still feeling terrible. We're like, all right, let's just go to urgent care. Let's go to ER and, you know, maybe you need a different antibiotic or something. Um, and, and yeah, so we're sitting there waiting, you know, they put him on IV fluids and as he's, you know, getting that, um, hydration, he's starting to feel better. And he's like making jokes about it, you know, like, oh yeah, coming to the ER for a cold, you know? And, um, and then the doctor comes in, um, maybe, you know, 20 minutes later. And, you know, he was this jovial guy who, you know, was first like, okay, let's get you back on your honeymoon. Like, let's see what you need and get, you know, get you back out there. Um, and then he comes in and his face was just like, he was white. He looked really somber. He just, 
and we were thinking, oh my gosh, what happened in one of the other rooms next to us? Like this guy, yeah, right. you know? Um, and so then he starts doing this whole, you know, okay, well, I have some good news and some bad news, you know, and he's kind of, you know, not making eye contact and we're like, okay, you know, what's the good news? And it's like, well, the good news is that you don't have the flu. Cause we really didn't want him to have the flu because that could last for a couple of weeks. We're like, hopefully it's just something you can take some antibiotics and feel better the next day. Um, we're like, okay, what's the bad news? It's like, the bad news is that you have no white blood cells mm -hmm. and I'm not medically anything yeah. <laughs> medically competent. Mm -hmm. And so I, that meant nothing to me. Whereas Matt, you know, knew a little more and, um, was like, Oh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, can someone explain this to me? What does this mean? You know? And anyway, he broke it down. He's like, it means, you know, he has a very serious disease um you know basically either something like AIDS or cancer and I'm like or yeah. or a cold maybe or the flu yeah. you know and he's like no so that moment changed everything um we were then admitted to the hospital immediately we were placed in a um, isolation unit where it's like negative airflow. He had no immune system. And so um, we couldn't even open the windows because spores from the plants outside coming in could kill him. Like if you have no immune system, it's, it's crazy. Like just the things that are in our environment that can, um, that can take you out. And so, you know, we, I remember I opened the window when we got in there because it was a beautiful summer, you know, and they're like, shut the window. Um, and so there we are, you know, living in, well, now, you know, yeah. living in this hospital room. We didn't know we'd be living there as long as we ended up living there. But um, so, yeah, um, two days, I think it was within about 48 hours, they started him on uh, chemo and he just started, you know, Ooh. acute mild leukemia is a bad one. You know, yeah. it, it just goes quickly. And, um, and you know, so they told us, you know, if, if you wouldn't have come to the hospital when you did, he would have been dead within two weeks. Oh my goodness. Um, wow. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, long story short, you know, he started declining quickly and, um, you know, he got up at one point um to use the bathroom and I he was kind of helping him and he just you know collapsed in my arms and oh. and coded you know his vitals dropped he coded I was like screaming for um help and the code team rushed in and rushed him up um to ICU and then you know um it was just one of those things where for a long time you know that was our life um yeah. We were eventually transferred from, you know, this um, hospital it was in Kootenai County or Kootenai County Regional Hospital in Coeur d'Alene. Um, once Matt finally got stable enough, you know, um, they got him on a life flight, me and him down to uh, a major cancer center in San Diego, which is how we ended up here and which is where we currently still live. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, when I read how long you were there, so you left your livelihood in, in New Zealand to mm -hmm. be on vacation in the States. Yeah. One of the things that you failed to mention was it wasn't just a couple of days. It was a year in isolation, mm -hmm. not, not just a year, just the, it, a year in isolation. Yeah. Um, just could you explain what, what, uh, isolation is i know you said the spores and everything and having yeah. had a father that went through i think i told you multi-myeloma yeah. uh very aware of some of those those things but mm -hmm. isolation is a whole different ball game what was it is yeah can you i know it's going deep but what yeah was, what was the what was the experience yeah it was it was crazy you know so um Every, you know, so when we arrived at UCSD, you know, it was life flight and then ambulance would get in there, you know, and um, he has to be, you know, we all have to be wearing masks and they get us, you know, straight into the bone marrow transplant unit, which is 
um, known for being the sickest floor on the hospital and Matt was the sickest person on that floor. Um, and so we were initially, you know, living in the hospital in um, like a negative airflow room, like no one can come in or out without wearing a mask. They can't have any, you know, symptoms of anything. Um, that was our hospital life. And we, you know, eventually um, when we were able to get out of the hospital for various periods, we would, we lived in transplant housing for a while. So basically if you're um, on the waiting list for a bone marrow transplant, or if you've received one, they have, the hospital has some special housing. Um, and, you know, you, you can't like, you can't have exposure really to kind of anything, you know, anytime we um, left the house and it had to be for basically to go to the hospital to get, you know, blood transfusions or whatever transfusions he needed. Um, we'd have to wear a mask. We'd have to stay away from people. Um, we couldn't really have people over. Um, there came a point where we could, but you know, there were these crazy rules we had to have in place, you know, and um, friends would book, you know, tickets to fly in. And we'd say, if you like start to get a tickle in your throat, you know, even if you spent thousands of dollars coming to see him, you need to cancel. Like we, you know, any, any bug, any germ, um, can kill him. And so it was just, yeah, it was a very isolating existence as you can imagine. And I remember, you know, at one point about a year later, whenever Matt was finally able to go out into the real world for a bit, um, he went to the grocery store and was like, wow, there's just so many things to look at, you know, like there's so, so many things on the shelf and, and different colors and different, you know, we had just lived in this box of this tiny little transplant housing apartment. And then, and then we lived in this other um, little apartment that was right next to the hospital. And all he saw were those white walls every day. Um, and yeah, it was. So was to, to put it in perspective a little bit, Marie. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times when you think of a, a patient in isolation, it's somebody that has, like say you have like tuberculosis or something like that. And so the idea is, is that you don't want that person to infect the people around them. Mm -hmm. um, what she's talking about is, is like a, it's a reverse isolation. So the idea there is, is that basically you're protecting that person from everyone mm -hmm. around them, everybody that comes into that room. I mean, it's such a, it's, it really is. It's, you know, we, we talk about isolation and this is like a whole nother level. Yeah. The thing that kind of blows my mind a little bit is, you know, I've, I've seen people, um, in that situation at the hospital, you know, the, the hospitals that I've worked in and stuff like that is, you know, most of the time, you know, they, that's their home base. That's where, mm -hmm. that's where they live. That's where they mentally, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's their center of their little universe. I can't even imagine what that was like for you guys. Yeah. Like, you probably just had whatever was in your suitcases, <laughs> yeah. you know, like we're going to yeah. be on vacation and have a good time. Yeah. That had to be incredibly disorienting. What was that like? A hundred percent. Yeah. I had that like, clothes for Broadway, you know, I mean, <laughs> things that you do not want to live in, in a hospital. And yeah. so I was, yeah, my friends, you know, were, um, my mom, my friends, people were like donating, you know, clothes and pillows to us and making target runs and being like, here's, you know, a, t a tank top or, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. um to sleep in and and yeah I, and then you know my bed was um so the the first couple nights in the hospital you know they have those those chairs those like pull out cops yep. mm -hmm. um but I didn't know that they turned it into a bed and you know one of the <sighs> nurses said like oh these pull out into a bed or something you know and so I tried pulling it out and it pulled out part way but um more kind of like a recliner and no one knew how to pull it out all the way. So the first couple of nights, I'm just kind of sleeping on this chair, half oh, no. on, half off. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, the, yeah, the rest of, um, you know, the next year when we were in hospitals, it was like, 
sometimes you'd get a cot, sometimes you wouldn't, sometimes I'd be sleeping on the floor, sometimes, you know, yeah. um, yeah, it's just a very, eventually, you know, I mean, they knew us so well and we'd come and the first thing I'd say is like, can I get a cot please? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so. What's amazing straight. on just hearing this is, the, is, 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 is uh, uh, kumbaya it sounds, man, the, the level between you folks mm. was so ridiculously strong. I mean, this is, I know that this is a honeymoon and so on and so forth, but you talk about a trial of all trials to start off the marriage. I can't even imagine the strength that the, that forged in the, the two of you. Um, it, it, it truly, that's a, what just nailed me as I was reading your story is it was so new and fresh, but here you are so much the better. And, uh, yeah. right. And I don't want to focus on, on 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 just that trial and i'm i'm sorry that it took so long to do some of that no no but, <laughs> but no but, but i i want to see how this was because let's face it a year away from a job means most likely you don't have a job when you come back right mm -hmm. and so there were those things that you started doing to share your your story to the world and I know that you did a blog and I've read some of that blog and just blown away. But how did that blog help you uh, not only just, just keep your own mind, but what were some of the responses that buoyed you up, uh, if you will? Yeah, yeah, good question. And, you know, so that blog we initially started um, as a way to keep friends and family members up to date because um, mm -hmm. I just couldn't manage all the text messages and emails and, and whatnot. And so it was initially private, you know, it had a pass, it was password protected. And, and a lot of our friends are, you know, in the medical field and, and whatnot. And so they'd want to know, okay, what's his platelet count today? What's his AMCs? What are, his, you know, and so I would literally just be going on there. Okay, here's, here's the numbers, you know, and then they could text me and respond, you know, with whatever, um, you know, additional information um, they had. So, and then, and then it became, you know, kind of a bit of a, a diary as well, you know, where we would just, I mean, we had no one to really talk to, right. You know, I mean, we're living in isolation and, um, and so we would kind of start writing about our, just our feelings, our day-to-day -day experiences. Um, and, and then, you know, long story short, we, we got to a point where we realized you know, we kept thinking like, okay, we're going to go back to New Zealand in a couple of weeks. And, you know, and we got to a point where we realized we're not going to go back to New Zealand anytime soon. He needs this bone marrow transplant. It's super ex expensive. We were battling with insurance, um, which ultimately worked out, but, um, but long story short, before the bone marrow transplant, they said, you need, I needed to sign something saying that I would be his full-time caregiver, because if he doesn't have a full-time caregiver for at least a year, yeah. he, they wouldn't do the bone marrow transplant because his, the likelihood of it being successful, it would not justify the cost. You know, they're yeah. about a million dollars with, oh you know, goodness. by the time all is said and done. Wow. Um, and so I, and obviously I'm going to be his full-time caretaker, you know, I mean, there, that wasn't, that was never a question that crossed my mind, you know, but so I signed this thing and then the reality hit, you know, of, okay, neither of us are going to be able to work for the next year. Um, like we still need to eat. We need like a place to sleep outside of the hospital, you know, like just this financial reality started hitting us. Um, and, you know, we had a savings, you know, I mean, I, we both had great jobs back in New Zealand and, um, but it was, you know, the magnitude of the potential expense was right in front of us. And, um, long story short, I decided to start a GoFundMe page and I made the blog public. Um, and I, I actually drove around, this is like crazy to like, when I think back to this, but like, I was so like, how are we going to raise this money? You know, I need to get like the word out about this GoFundMe page. Like I was driving around to like Starbucks in La Jolla, like around the hospital, like putting up like flyers, like here's a link to our GoFundMe page, please help us, you know? And then I went to bed 
um, that night, I think it was, was it the night before his transplant? Uh, the dates are bl blurring together, but I, I just remember going to bed with this angst of how are we going to survive? And then waking up, you know, in the, I mean, we're constantly waking up in the middle of the night because people are coming in to, you know, do different things in the hospital. Um, and around like three in the morning, like looking and seeing like, oh, the GoFundMe page, we're getting donations and we're getting stuff. And then it was like wildfire within like a week, our story was all over like international headlines and we'd raised $80,000 and had like all this support coming in from people all around the world and just the most beautiful messages from, you know, from complete strangers that really just helped uplift us during this time where it's like, you know, we, we look at things in the world sometimes and we just kind of see that, you know, that people can be so mean and so, you know, everyone feels so distanced from each other and, you know, there's no community, um, which, you know, growing up like in Hawaii on the North Shore, you feel like a sense of community Yeah. and you can get, and then in New Zealand, there's very much that as well. And you can just feel so disconnected from the world and living in isolation. Like we were, we felt really disconnected and all of a sudden we just felt this overwhelming support and this community and, and just, you know, we're blown away by just humankind um and their yeah generosity that had to have been just so impactful just having all of a sudden you know you guys have been in isolation for so long i imagine your feeling of hope was pretty tenuous at times and then just to have something like that start to materialize yeah. had to have been just such a major boost for you guys I yeah can, i can yeah. imagine how how that would have been like it was incredible and i mean it, like we even had so um new zealand the all blacks of their yep. rugby team that very yep. yeah um one uh, matt's favorite player from the all blacks called us in the hospital to, <laughs> what? yeah i i know <laughs> I, this is like this is the sort of like we were just blown away like what is happening right now you know we felt so isolated and so alone um and what i what i realized though is like you know we had we had been kind of you know you go into like this private mode right when something like crazy happens and you're just you know you feel so just vulnerable and like kind of naked right i mean we're like we were too like successful professionals in our early to mid thirties, you know, life was going so well, you know, our Instagram page was full of the best travel locations, you know, <laughs> I mean, it was like, that was, that was our life. Right. And then all of a sudden our life went to, oh my God, like, you know, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we don't even have a bed to sleep on. We're having to like ask our friends and family for money when, when we both are like, you know, we thought we were doing well and now we're nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was just very um, obviously humbling. And it was hard to, like, I think the last line in my GoFundMe post was, you know, this is the hardest sentence I've ever had to write, but we need help, you know, and I had never had to just come out and say that before. And I think that sort of vulnerability, you know, and when people, um, when you just sort of open yourself up um, yeah. to the world and, and allow people to kind of, I don't know, see what you're going through and, and experience it with you and, and come into your world, people will do that they will show up for you and it was a very eye-opening experience um yeah it, but i haven't i've never been in the to the extent that you were i i have had when we lost a job and it, it is a humbling thing i remember the first time i received a, a care packet i go who the heck gave this to me 
uh, I, take it back. <laughs> I don't, yeah. you know, that, that level of pride really sucks, yeah. man. But, yes. but, but then you, to your point, you just see the, the caring of people. Your mm-hmm. blog, what nailed me is being able to relate a lot. Some of the stuff that my dad went through, for instance, before he passed, it, it brought back a lot of memories. And I just felt this compulsion to mm. reach out and go, oh, my goodness, trust me, you're not alone at this stuff. And yeah. the blog was so unique because you it, it created that that desire to reach out and go, no, man, you're not alone. Uh, matter mm. of fact, here's how we're going to do it. And, and that's what you, to your point, it just united in such a way that you talk about Hawaii extended Ohana extended family, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of a sudden you have all this extended family that comes in and wow, what, yeah. what an amazing story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really, yeah, that sort of the bond that it created, I mean, is just beyond anything I could have ever expected. And it was actually like very overwhelming for us yeah. because we just felt this enormous sense of gratitude. You know, yeah. every person who donated $5 and left a message or whatever, like we wanted to respond to each one. We wanted to thank each person. We still want to pay back each person, you know? That, <laughs> and it's like, we can't, you know, like we don't even know who all these people are. And and then there was complete strangers donating a thousand dollars or oh like, or $5,000. And, and it was just so like, how are people so kind, you yeah. know, like I had never experienced so much overwhelming kindness in my life. And when we we're in such a dark place to see yeah. such a bright light in humanity yeah. was, was just so powerful. And it's just, sort of engendered in us this feeling of we need to pay it forward always you know like we always need to be paying this forward to anyone and everyone and you know in whatever way we possibly can and um yeah and it's and it's so rewarding to to do that you know and um yeah yeah, it really changed our whole outlook it's interesting and and gary i'm sorry to interject on this no 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 what what blows my mind about this whole experience and in, and some of the things that I went through too is you have these assumptions of people and then all of a sudden they're just blown up. I go, I know for a fact there were people that I didn't really particularly care for that contributed to our sustenance and when in that mm-hmm. time of need. And mm-hmm. it makes you really think of, I got these people wrong and we might have differences of opinion, but all in all, man, we, we still, we still are an extended family here. Yeah. But the other thing that uh, is coming out, uh, it reinforces what I experienced too, is that we have not, it's not only assumptions, but we start to realize what's truly important. Yeah. And it's not all, all the different material things. It's not about how many Facebook friends or whatever. It's, you get down to the raw idea, um, idea of what really truly matters. Yeah. And that, that's something, again, that, that your story just inspired that brought back so many memories of that. But, mm. Yeah. It's, your, your story, and this is obviously on a much smaller scale, but it reminds me of an experience I had ages ago. I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, the sharpest tool in the shed, as Maurice knows. So I do a lot of dumb things, but I was actually down in, in, a, in Mexico by myself on a little adventure, and I had broken down, and a, an elderly gentleman came in, and he had basically had the tool that I needed um, to get out of the situation I was in. And I remember after I was all done, you know, I, I, I started pulling out some, you know, some cash to pay him back. And he kept saying this statement over and over again, and he was shaking his head and shaking his head. And anyway, his, his little, um, I don't know, if some family member that was with him, this, this younger kid, I was like, what is he saying? He, and, and he said, he said, don't, don't take this away from me. 
Ooh. You know, and and it was such a powerful statement for me, and it, yeah. and it, it, stick, it sticks with me to this day. Wow. You know what I mean? And so, like, Same goosebumps. That so, is, yeah. man. It's chicken skin. Man. Yeah, chicken yeah. skin. <laughs> so, like, you know, and obviously, what you went through is on, on such a, a larger scale. But all those people, I mean, yeah, it's a positive thing for them as well. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think I think people really need to. They want those opportunities to help other people and they want yeah. to be able to quietly help others. You know what I mean? And so anyway, yeah. that's a statement that, that I kind of, that I live by. I love that, you know, and I've <laughs> never heard that before. And, and that actually, that changes my perspective on so much, you know, because <laughs> we live in this feeling of, you know, this deep like debt of gratitude almost you know where we want to we want to pay people back we feel like we never we'll never be able to you know like I said because we don't even know who most of these people are but um and and some people we do know who they are but you're right that you know giving that money back is not what they want you know like yeah. the greatest like thing is that like they feel like they have contributed and every year you know we send out a Christmas card with updates on, you know, we now have our three-year-old son, Granite, and we, you know, have this life that we've rebuilt. And yeah. we send this Christmas card out every year with photos and an update and just saying, thank you for everything you did to help us get here. Our life that we're living right now is because of you. Yeah. And, you know, we will. I mean, that's the best thing that you could do. Yep, I really do. There's no doubt about it. And I just want you to know, Danny, I've known Gary for almost 30 years. That literally is the most profound statement that's come out of his mouth. In that time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was that, that's awesome. pretty bad because it, it wasn't even my statement. So. <laughs> well, Danny, getting back to your story too, is you went through this tremendous trial. Then you have this mm -hmm. tremendous support, all these highs and lows. I can't even imagine what those things felt like. And then um, it wasn't New Zealand anymore. You decided yeah. to start something. Uh, and, and I don't, it, it wasn't legal. Was it legal up? Was that what? No, about? no, no. That is my newest. Newest. Thing. Okay. But, but yeah, like, the, so the way that, that you know, this all came about. So after, you know, we were released back into the wild about, you know, <laughs> a year, almost a year to the date after, yeah, almost a year to the day after um, this all began, you know, we got the, the sort of, okay, you guys can go back to work now and things are stable enough. I mean, Matt still had to like go to the hospital three times a week before work to get, you know, an infusion of this or that, or, you know, to get his blood labs and stuff. So it wasn't normalcy completely, but it was like, you can start working again. Right. It's like, great, can finally work and start making some income. I can, <laughs> you know, and, and we still couldn't leave San Diego because it, we were tethered to that hospital, you know? And right. so it's like, all right, we're going to have to like rebuild things here in San Diego. And Matt um, was, from San Diego. Um, I had lived here for some time, but anyway, long story short, it was like, okay, we can rebuild a life here um, or at least a temporary life or something. And um, Matt was able to get a job pretty quickly. Um, you know, structural engineer, he had a ton of um, experience, especially, you know, working in New Zealand, the, you know, the shaky aisles as they call them. Um, so he was in high demand. I um, tried to get a job, you know, I applied to law firms and I applied as in-house counsel, you know, I was, um, I was in-house counsel, well, I'd, I'd worked, you know, at a law firm doing, you know, cross-border mergers and acquisitions before that. And then I'd worked at um, a multinational company as in-house counsel. And I just thought, I'll have no problem getting a job, like, this will be great. Um, I could not get anyone to hire me mm -hmm. to save my life. I was sending out application after application, you know, I mean, letter, cover letter after cover letter, you know, just both, you know, just cold 
calling essentially, yeah. and then responding to, you know, job, um, listings and everything was just the automated response back. Thank you, but no, thank yeah. you. <laughs> and I, you know, again, that was a very humbling experience for me. It was like, uh, okay. Um, so that feeling of just rejection, 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 rejection. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually got to a point where I was like, I've, I've never been rejected so much in my life. I need to figure out a way to take the sting out of this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to turn it around and make rejection a positive thing. So every time I get rejected, I'm going to look at it as one step closer to achieving my goal. I don't know how many times I need to get rejected before someone says yes, but it, there is some finite number there. And every rejection I get closer to that gets me closer to my goal. You know, so I, yeah. I was like, yes, I got another rejection today. One, you know, <laughs> one closer to my goal. <laughs> and, and long story short, I ended up um, kind of just doing some like um, consulting gigs. So I was working for this, um, company that's a spinoff of Deloitte, just kind of, you know, doing some consulting for some of their clients. It was very like hit or miss. Um, and then I ended up working with like a couple different startups in the Bay area, um, working remotely mainly. Um, I mean, yeah, I was working remotely. I would, you know, I flew up once or twice to meet with people in person and then, um, and then, yeah, I just, you know, ended up getting into this startup space that I had never been in before. I loved it. Um, yes. It was like a wild ride compared to, you know, working in a publicly traded company that's been around for a hundred years or whatever, you know, where everything is just, you know, you do it a certain way and it's, you know, a slow moving, um, you know, kind of dinosaur um, getting any, you know, change to happen. These startups, they're just like, move fast and break things, you know, I'm like, okay, <laughs> yep. all right, let's try not to break too many things, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'll, sure, you know, it was just fun and wild. And so um, I, um, yeah, long story short, like I ended up getting into that space, ended up um, taking a job um, as in-house counsel to, um, you know, a Silicon Valley startup and did that for a couple of years. And then, um, you know, we, we had our son, um, crazy story. He, so, so just to digress for a second, um, <laughs> you know, they told us after Matt's transplant that we'd never be able to have kids. And we, you know, we tried everything, um, you know, to, like there was just, there was like all hope was lost. Um, right. And um, a long story short, we ended up finding out on the third anniversary of his diagnosis, which is a very like emotional day for me always, or a very mm -hmm. emotional like week. Um, so I usually like plan something like, let's do a little staycation or let's do something, you know, cause that, that date just always hits me hard. Yeah. Um, and that day, three years after his diagnosis, we found out we were pregnant. <laughs> so <Right>. nice. <laughs> and, wow. I mean, what an appropriate name too. Granite? I mean, Granite. It's great. I mean, That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. He, he lives up to that. We wanted to give him a strong name. And <laughs> oh, my gosh, does he live up to that name every day of his life? He is... <laughs> He has, yeah. he has the mana. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. For those of you yeah. out there, mana means power in Hawaiian. So. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. And the business too, you, you started that, yeah. your, your own business and mm -hmm. what it went from one, you, you, you were shooting for one goal, but you 10 X that goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is also crazy. You know, it's like one thing I've just, I've learned throughout all this, like everything, you know, my husband always said this when he was going through his battle is odds are for other people. I'm one of one, you know, like his odds mm. were not, they were not good, but he, A, he always refused to hear the odds. You know, the doctor's like, okay, do you want to know? He's like, nope, don't tell me. 
closet for other people, I'm one of one. Um, so, That's awesome. So we write that down. <laughs> <laughs> so we never actually knew, like, the act. I mean, we knew they were bad based on, you know, the doctors and our friends that were doctors, kind of, you know. Um, but we never actually knew the statistics until years later when we found out, you know, unintentionally, but, (laughs) um, but you know, that is what I've taken with me in every aspect of my life is just do it. You know, there's, you know, if you set your mind to something, you can do it. And I remember one of the nurses, when we arrived at the hospital in, in San Diego via life flight, via ambulance, you know, again, Matt was the sickest person on the bone marrow transplant floor, which is one of the sickest floors in the hospital. And we're in our room and the first nurse comes in there and he just looks terrible. Um, And she took one look at him and she was like, ah, you're going to make it. And I was like, (laughs) what? Like, I mean, I swear everyone that had been looking at him to date was like, Ooh, gosh, you know, like, And I had asked, like every night I would ask the nurses, the doctor, is he going to make it through the night? And they would just like, look at me and, and say, you know, do you have family here? Do you have, you know, someone you can call, you know, and like, just tell me he's going to make it, you know, and no one would ever tell me that. And this nurse came in and looked at him and was like, you're going to make it. And I was like, how do you know that? (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I can tell just from looking at him, like his attitude, she's like, this is so much about attitude. And I can tell from like the minute I look at someone, whether they are determined enough to make it or whether they've given up already. And she's like, that is what completely impacts your outcome. And she was right. She was a hundred percent right. And there were so many times, I can't, countless times that he should not have made it and made it just yeah. over and over and over again. And I've like taken that and applied that to every aspect of my life. You know, Matt just applies it naturally. I've had to learn it, you know, through, um, through watching him. And, you know, I took that same thing and applied that to rebuilding my career. And I, um, after having granite, I left my in-house job and decided I'm going to start my own practice, my own consultancy. Um, I'm going to, you know, spend more time like with my family, with my baby, with my husband. And, um, so I left my job, uh, it was in either October or November of 2019. Mm -hmm. And I decided to take the holidays off, you know, spend it with, Um, granted it was about six months old at the time and then really you know launched my practice in January of 2020 Um, and the first couple months were pretty lean and I you know I knew it was gonna you know it takes a while to build something from scratch right and so I was like okay I set myself some modest goals like if I can just make like 100 grand a year this year and next year um I, that's great. I mean, to be able to generate a hundred thousand dollars on my own and, you know, we can pay our bills and, um, and then COVID hit, you know, yeah. I started my practice in January, COVID hit in March. And I'm like, well, this was probably the biggest mistake of my life, but I'm not going <laughs> to look at it that way. I'm just going to keep going and choose to believe that this will be successful and I will make it successful. And yeah long story short, you know, less than two years later, surpassed that, you know, million dollar revenue. I mean, it wasn't even a goal. I was just like a, you know, like I just sort of looked back and was like, had this realization a couple of weeks ago, like, oh my gosh, like I've surpassed every goal by so much, you know? And Yeah. You, yeah. you actually just reinforced something. You remember I told you we interviewed another uh, Hawaiian guy, Richie Norton out there. Yeah. Actually, he's a transplant Hawaiian over there. Mm-hmm. And he said something that was interesting. He goes, too many people are working toward a goal. 
instead mm. of working from it. And when you work from the goal, all these other things that we, we, we're working toward uh, initially, they all come to pass anyway, because we're yeah. true to something. And that's yeah. exactly what you did. You just started from something and you're working from it. Uh, and yeah. it was, I know you set yourself a monetary value, but the fact of the matter is your primary thing was a consultancy to make a difference in people's lives. Yeah. And you, you crushed it. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for, uh, thanks for reinforcing what Richie told us, man. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean it, that I couldn't agree more though. You know, it is just like a get out there and do it and whatever it is that you want to do and whatever change you want to make in the world and your life and anything just do it and yeah 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 you can this, and you will oh my goodness that i i'm loving everything that you've done everything you've overcome but selfishly for the inspiration that you've just given me and pulling out a, a nugget of wisdom from Gary again that was so profound, I, I, I don't know where it, I just came from too. So you inspired all that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad I inspired the nugget of wisdom too because I'm taking that with me. <laughs> that has... no, your, 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 your guys' story is just, I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, how do people find your blog? I mean, I'm, they can still go back and, and look at it, I assume. Yeah, I think it's, there's got to be so much inspiration mm -hmm. there. How do people find that? So um, Team Fontanessi, you know, Fontanessi is our last name. We've also okay. shortened it just to teamfont.com. Oh, no um, way. Okay, teamfont.com. Yeah. All right, we'll make, um, make sure that gets in the show notes because, I mean, that's, no that's got to yeah. be just unreal. Yeah, and I actually, yeah, we, we want to keep – that go we've admittedly have not posted as many updates as we should be on there but one of the things i was looking for a lot when we were going through everything is inspiration from other people who were going through something similar and i just wanted to see them living a normal life like yeah. post all of this you know i wanted to see them on the beach somewhere i wanted to see them you know and so i promised myself that i that i would do that that i would continue to post stories of here we are now, here's our child, here's our, you know, um, and I've done a little bit of that. I haven't kept up with it as much as I should, but, um, but there are updates on there and it is on my agenda to keep it <laughs> updated. And I, I, for one, am definitely looking forward to that. Um, and I can't thank you enough for spoiling us with your time and, and just your experience. Please tell Matt, that uh he's a he's a raging awesome individual <laughs> i've never met the I dude <laughs> read the story he had hair like me at one point and now he has a whole head back good night <laughs> but I, I also wanted to thank you for your time <laughs> yeah this has been my absolute pleasure and yeah thanks so much for having me on this has been so fun you guys are awesome you're fun <laughs> like and honestly this is the first podcast i've ever done i was really nervous about it and you made it so easy so you. oh no you, you, you killed it you're <laughs> you are a natural and, oh, and well, if there's you. anything we can ever do just let us know okay uh, i so appreciate it well yeah. happy friday enjoy your weekend and thanks again <laughs>